All right. Today is Wednesday, September 8th. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. Before we start, I have some clarifications and some points to address. Number one, this guideline that I have showed you about a couple of weeks ago. Now, we have certain viewers who don't watch the entire video, and that's totally understandable because these videos are too long for some. But I do provide details and valuable insights for everything I mention in this channel. Among them, this guideline. And I told you that this is a guideline for the algos, so long as the market is guided by algos, because algos need guidelines. They're not that intelligent, believe it or not, and this is the kind of guideline that algos look at when trading the market. But I also said that once the human being is involved once again in the market, the guideline will change, because the guidelines that the human being uses to guide their decision making in the market are different than the guidelines that algos use. For example, today the dollar index traded higher, even though it fluctuated back and forth, but all in all traded higher. On the other hand, yields for the 10-year treasury were actually trading down. And we had some elements of the auction. The auction was hotter than expected, and therefore, yields went down. Now, typically, the algos looking at the US dollar trading higher and yields trading down will tend to favor technology stocks, while not favoring inflationary stocks, commodities, and even oil. But what was the reality today? The reality was oil trading higher, and everything else trading down, including technology stocks. There are several factors here when the human being is involved in guiding their decisions. For example, when it comes to crude oil prices, we got news that the shortages and dent in supply from Hurricane Ida will prolong way beyond expectations, meaning prices for crude oil, but specifically natural gas, spiked up higher, significantly higher for natural gas. Likewise, when it comes to the indiscriminate sell-off that we saw in the market today, including the Nasdaq, even though yields were trading down, is due to the involvement of individual investors. To illustrate, from my personal experience, I have clients, and I've been telling them, before September, we're about to head into a correction in September and October, and it could be a severe one since we have not had even a 5% correction for a while. And therefore, you guys have to think about protecting your portfolio, taking profits off the table, or hedging by buying puts or selling calls. A lot of my clients, and these are intelligent people, by the way, high net worth, business kind of people, retirees, etc. Before September, they were extremely reluctant to even take profits off the table. Why? Because the Fed still has our backs. The Fed will not taper. The dips are being bought. Everybody's expecting a correction in September, and when everybody's expecting a correction in September, it's not going to happen, yada, yada, yada. Now think about it. While they're saying everybody's expecting a correction in September, they refuse to even book profits off the table. So is it really everybody expecting a correction in September, or actions speaking louder than words, and nobody is expecting a correction in September, and therefore the correction is likely to happen? Now all of a sudden, all of these clients want to protect their portfolios. They want to take profits off the table, they want to buy put options, they want to sell calls, and now we're hedging their portfolios. But heading into September, nobody, nobody wanted to even hedge. So once again, use the guidelines and apply your own intelligence because algos are extremely limited. You have to be specific in the guidelines you give to algos. But human beings, it depends on the psychology, it depends on the sentiment at the time. In the beginning of the month, nobody wanted to take profits. Now, all of a sudden, everybody wants to take profits. So that's point number one. The other point in my notes that I want to address is the fact that I uh, disappointed and perhaps made certain people upset by my commentary regarding cryptos, aka the tulip market. Now we know that we are in this tribal environment in investing where stocks are being treated as horses and football teams. Meanwhile, investors turned into hooligans cheerleading for these stocks and these tulips. Now, remember what Warren Buffett said. He said, don't fall in love with any stock or any investment for that matter, because the stock doesn't love you back. So all of you who are in love with BTC, AMC, GME, understand that the stock doesn't love you back. 
the stock could care less about you. So all of this cheerleading and teams, apes, Spartans, donkeys, all of this is garbage. At the end of the day, you have to evaluate every investment based on the merits of fundamentals, momentum, macro, etc. Now, I have traded tulips up and down, buying tulips, selling tulips, shorting tulips. So I am a participant in the tulip market, but I would never actually invest in one of these and perhaps bet my life savings, my tuition money, my home equity loan on a tulip. Never, because it is an unstable market with no fundamentals at all. There is no way you can value what BTC or ETH or Doge or whatever is worth from an intrinsic value perspective. I have made my criticism clear. When you have Kim Kardashian, Segal, uh, and the homeless guy down the street pumping cryptos, we get a problem here. On top of that, the environmental concerns of the electricity usage from cryptos. But if that wasn't enough, perhaps the core criticism with the crypto market is it sailed away without the government and Wall Street being involved. Now, what does that mean? It means that it is too late for the government or Wall Street to get involved in cryptos right now. And without the government and Wall Street having a significant stake in this, they're going to have to crush it because it's a threat to their system. Understand the blockchain technology is extremely valuable. It is brilliant and it has many uses and utilities. But without the government and Wall Street being involved, there is no security or future at all for Bitcoin or any crypto. And of course, the government has two choices. Number one, destroy the crypto market via regulations or steal the blockchain technology and adapt them in central banks' digital currencies, which doesn't seem to be the direction that the Fed or the ECB is heading toward. So my guess is that they will use the SEC and other regulators around the world to destroy the crypto market and make it pretty much less potent and less dangerous to the system that we have. What does that mean? The crypto market will crash? And it will be less attractive. You're not going to see these sizable gains where we can think about cryptos as wealth creator. Instead, we will think about them, as I do right now, as tradable assets. And that's about it. Point number three in my notes is a comment from a viewer. I'm not going to single this particular viewer out because it's a common view against Paul Volcker, which I brought up in the program last night. And the criticism goes... Paul Volcker is glorified among Fed critics and Wall Street critics. Yet the truth is, Paul Volcker had very little knowledge about the banking industry and how it works. So I will let Paul Volcker answer and address this criticism from the grave. Three decades later, he's under attack again, this time from the banks. Some CEOs have been particularly critical of you. I wasn't aware of that. That amazes me. <laughs> Are you telling me that? No. Uh, Jamie Dimon, the head of J.P. Morgan Chase, said Paul Volcker, by his own admission, has said he doesn't understand capital markets. He has proven that to me. Well, unfortunately, I think that they proved some of that to me, too. <laughs> I mean, their own misunderstanding. How did they get in so much trouble? And while we're at it, here's a point that I forgot to bring up in yesterday's video, which is the difference between the Volcker dilemma and the Powell dilemma. You see, back in the day when Volcker was in charge, the debt to GDP ratio was low. It wasn't significant at all. So raising interest rates and being aggressive with raising interest rates, yes, it will crash the economy, it will cause a recession, but it will be worth it in the long term. This time around, in the Powell dilemma, Powell doesn't have this kind of flexibility because we have a cartoonish debt to GDP ratio, meaning that Powell will be limited in his options when addressing the stagflation. He will not be able to raise interest rates dramatically higher. And if he does, he will crash the entire global economy. And this is why we continue to say that Powell is playing with fire in assuming that inflation is transitory. Because if we get to the point where it becomes clear that inflation is not transitory, then his option will be not only crashing the economy, but destroying the global economy. Because raising interest rates these days is more destructive than the Volcker era. Why? Because we have an insane debt to GDP ratio. So this is an important point that you have to understand. And perhaps why central banks across the world are stuck between a rock and a hard place. Do you tighten to address the inflation dilemma or do you wait, hope and pray that inflation will go away and therefore you don't have to face these decisions? 
of raising interest rates dramatically when we have an insane debt to GDP ratio, not to mention zombie companies all over the place, drowned in debt. Take for example the comments that we got today from the Polish central bank chief. And this will perhaps make the three Polish viewers that we have in this channel a little happy. So if you are from Poland, leave a comment and I will send you a cookie. Anyhow, here it is. Poland keeps record low rate even with inflation at 20 year high. So inflation is surging in the country of Poland, but the central bank continues to keep interest rates at record low. Why? They cannot raise interest rates. Otherwise, they will crash the economy. At the same time, leaving inflation to continue to rise higher and higher and higher will lead the economy into stagflation. So once again, the cure is worse than the illness. Matter of fact, the central bank chief in Poland says that raising interest rates right now is extremely risky. Neither this month nor in October should rates be raised. He wrote in an article published Monday on the whatever that is website. Doing so in these months could give the impression to bond investors that the inflation threat is so big that rates need to be raised even before seeing. What does that mean? Since they're stuck between a rock and a hard place, their only choice right now is play propaganda, play the psychology battle, give bond investors the illusion and the impression that inflation is not a threat, cross your fingers, pray and hope that inflation will go away. Once again, this is a recipe for disaster. Either way, whether they actually address the inflation problem via tightening the monetary policy or letting inflation go, both scenarios are extremely dangerous. And this is what's going on right now in the global economy, not just the United States. Anyhow, let's move on to In Focus tonight. We're going to talk about the Fed's Beige Book and the admission of stagflation and shortages prolonging way and expectations. We're also going to talk about jolts because jobs openings were stunning today. Lastly, we're going to talk about this piece of shit Bob Kaplan out of the Dallas Fed who got caught inside of trading, by the way. Spoiler alert, he will get away with it. But first, let's start with the Fed's beige book. And here it is. The Federal Reserve's beige book report on economic activities cited a widespread pullback in dining out travel and tourism, reflecting safety concerns related to the latest COVID-19 surge. Listen to this headline. The Fed admits that we're seeing a pullback in dining, travel, and tourism due to the surge of COVID-19. So why are they using this as an excuse to continue to print and prop up the stock and real estate markets for Wall Street and the 1%? Because printing has been constant, and yet we're seeing widespread pullback in dining, travel, and tourism, which is causing the economy to slow down and create less jobs. If anything, this is yet another proof that the Fed's policy has nothing to do with the economic recovery or jobs creation, because the virus is in charge of the economic recovery and jobs creation. And the only byproduct right now from the Fed printing money out of thin air, $120 billion minimum in emergency support for Wall Street, the only byproduct of this operation, the cocaine operation, is creating bubbles hyperinflating the bubble in the equities and real estate markets. That's about it. And here is the commentary regarding stagflation. The Fed's policy is only succeeding in creating inflation now evolving into stagflation, but they're not creating jobs and they're not increasing the pace of economic activities. Beige Book, several districts, indicated that businesses anticipate significant hikes in their selling prices in the months ahead. So again, how long is transitory? You heard Mohamed el Arian yesterday saying that if by transitory they mean two years, then okay. But what is transitory? We've been already in over a year now in this inflation, almost. And they continue to say it's transitory, it's transitory, it's, it's transitory. But all we see on the ground is prices going higher and higher and higher. And listen to this, by the way. This is perhaps the most important admission in the Fed's beige book. When it comes to prices, firms have continued to report exceptionally widespread increases in input prices, particularly in construction, manufacturing, wholesale trade, and transportation and warehousing industries. Contacts in all sectors anticipate widespread input price hikes for the reminder of 2021. You hear that, Mr. Powell? Oh, wait a minute. You're the one who actually wrote this thing. 
Wow. Selling prices accelerated further, with particularly widespread price hikes reported by manufacturers and wholesalers. Retail prices have risen to varying degrees. Effective prices for both new and used vehicles are up sharply, while prices for general merchandise have risen moderately. A sizable share of contacts in all sectors plan to increase prices over the next six months. Again, this is a crime at this point. Mr. Powell, it is time to pull your head out of your ass. This is not transitory. When your own survey says prices will continue to increase higher for at least the next six months. This is not transitory at all. And listen to this when it comes to consumer spending. So prices are planned to go higher. What about spending? What about the demand? Consumer spending has leveled off in the latest report, reporting period. Non-auto retailers reported some plateauing in activity in recent weeks. Though one major chain did note continued improvement in sales in August, led by brisk back-to-school spending. In New York City, sales have continued to trend up as mask and vaccine mandates have alleviated some safety concerns, but they remain well below pre-pandemic levels, hampered by an ongoing dearth of international visitors and office workers. Retails have grown somewhat less optimistic about prospects for the reminder of 2021. Consumer confidence among New York state residents remained near record highs in July. So once again, what do you call an economic environment where spending is projected to plateau and weaken in the months ahead? Meanwhile, prices are expected to rise higher. This is classic stagflation. And the Beige Book, of course, revealed it's not just stagflation, but record shortages of everything. Massive shortages across the board, with no stop in sight, no relief in sight. Grocery stores are reportedly stocking up on snacks like Ritz crackers and Oreos, as workers' strikes prompt shortage fears. So it's not just the labor shortage. We have strikes, we have weird weather phenomenons, we have weird events like factory fires. We have climate change. We have rats contributing to the shortages on top of the reckless monetary policy. Once again, this is the ideal stagflation storm. Do you think Jerome Powell is even aware of what I'm talking about right now? Or is he just busy gambling and buying stocks like his buddy Kaplan? Rats, drought, and labor shortages eat into global edible oil recovery. And this is causing supply shocks in palm oil, for example, which is not that bad, by the way, because all of this palm oil consumption is destroying the jungle, the forest, in countries like Indonesia and Malaysia and driving animals to extinction, the likes of the orangutan, rhino, etc., they're all going extinct because they're destroying all of these forests in Indonesia and they're planting palm trees, which is native to Africa, to produce palm oil. Why? Because the Indians and Chinese buy palm oil because it's cheap. But what if the prices of palm oil continue to spike up higher? Perhaps this is what we need to find an alternative a cheaper cooking oil and save the forest and these animals from going extinct. But back to the shortages. You see, the Fed continues to say that the increase in car prices is transitory. It's due to the chip shortage, and once we have more chips, the supply will catch up with the demand, and everybody will live happily ever after. The problem is, the cost for shipping cars and transporting cars is exploding higher. Why? We have poor closures. We have labor shortages in ports across the world. Why? The COVID-19 crisis is not over. And for some reason, workers across the globe, not just the United States, across the world, refusing to go back to corporate slavery. And now the cost of moving cars across the ocean is at 13-year high. Hiring a vessel that can carry 5,000 cars costs $24,000 a day. Now, you're going to pay for that. The end customer is going to pay for that. And these shipping costs continue to increase by the day. And therefore, where is the end? Where is the transitory, Mr. Powell? And again, this is the ultimate stagflationary storm. And if Milton Friedman was alive right now, he would laugh his ass off. Because he says back in his day, in the great inflation of the 70s, there was no such thing as cost push inflation. Well, now we have cost push inflation for real this time around. Whether you have a reckless monetary policy or not, due to these weird events, the pandemic, 
the shortages, the fires, the rats. And now we have diseases among cows. Beef giant Brazil halts China exports after confirming two mad cow disease cases. Ta -da. And now the Biden administration is realizing that beef prices are skyrocketing. And consumers are starting to complain. Consumers are saying, Mr. Biden, gas prices continue to go higher. And oh, by the way, beef prices are going crazy. Out of whack. How long do we have to wait for your transitory? You and Mr. Powell, how long do we have to wait? Another two months? How about six? How about a year? How about two years? How about 50 years? What is the definition of transitory? Mr. Biden and Mr. Powell. And now, of course, Biden is going crazy, trying to address all of these insane increases in prices, specifically in beef. And he's doing so by more government intervention, more government regulations, more government oversight on beef producers because they're blaming the rise in beef prices to the fact that we have a semi-monopoly in the country when it comes to beef producers. With no competition, these producers can demand whatever prices they want. But once again, inflation is always, always, always been a monetary phenomenon. Stop the printing and beef prices will go down. But so long as the printing continues, beef prices will continue to skyrocket higher, regardless of how many providers and producers we have in the economy. Of course, more competition is welcomed, but it will not solve the price inflation in beef alone, so long as the Fed continues to print. And then we heard from this creature, New York Fed President Williams, who's Wall Street's favorite boy right now. Why? Because Williams is willing to make an asshat out of himself to continue to prop up, cheerlead, and advocate for the so-called accommodative policy from the Fed to Wall Street to continue. Remember, Wall Street has been under so-called emergency accommodation since the financial crisis of 2008. Those accommodations by the Fed were not removed. So the emergency, quote-unquote emergency, is still here for Wall Street. But somehow, we have Delta going on. Cases rising higher. But they're going to cut you off your unemployment benefit. They will go away. They already went away. They're not going to extend your unemployment benefits due to emergency conditions. But they will never cut the emergency conditions and emergency accommodation for Wall Street and the 1%. Now Williams now says, oh, we're not going to taper because the conditions of tapering, meaning substantial further progress, these conditions were not met when it comes to employment. And this guy is a bullshitter of the maximum degree. What do you call this, Mr. Williams? Because today we got the jolts, the jolts. There were 10.9 million unfilled jobs at the end of July when the Delta variant surge started, exceeding, pay attention now, exceeding the 8.7 million Americans who were unemployed and seeking a job in July, meaning that we had an excess of available jobs. We had more jobs than unemployed workers. So what is the problem? Why weren't these jobs filled? The reason is, perhaps, the pay is not so good. Workers are demanding higher wages. So when Williams and other Fed zombies say that we're waiting for substantial further progress in employment before tapering, what more are you looking for in substantial further progress? Would we have more jobs than people? What are you waiting for, Mr. Powell? If your true mandate is employment and price stability, you have achieved both. We have full employment in the economy. We we have more jobs than people to fill those jobs. And when it comes to inflation and price stability, prices are beyond stability at this point and rising out of control. If these are your mandates, then they have been met, more than met, and you should be tapering right fucking now. But if your true mandate is to prop up, preserve, inflate, and protect the assets of the wealthy, stocks and real estate, then perhaps you shouldn't tighten because you have to prop up the stock market and real estate market to infinity and beyond to continue to make the rich richer and richer and richer every day. So which one is your mandate? I think the answer is clear here. Even small businesses are saying we have unfilled jobs openings. Half of U.S. small businesses have unfilled jobs openings. The workers are here, but they're not liking the wages. They want more wages. This is a spiral with no end in sight. Wages will continue to rise higher and higher and higher. The Fed and their allies are wagering that the so-called enhanced unemployment employment benefits 
or the reason for these jobs being unfilled. And now that we have these enhanced unemployment benefits expiring, and they expired for most people, by the way, incentivizing them to fill those jobs, whether they like the wages or not, because they have no alternative. Tina, but what if that doesn't happen? What if the extra 300 bucks a week is just one reason among many prompting workers to wait and stay at home rather than filling those jobs? Then we will continue to see wages rising higher and higher and higher every single month while the pace of economic activity continues to slow down. Therefore, stagflation. And of course, we have workers who are taking advantage of the labor shortage and the boycott from workers. We're all hodling right now to the moon, bro. We're going to wait wait and wait and wait to wages skyrocket higher and then we'll take the jobs but we have paper hands who are not waiting and they're actually scoring pretty decent deals by the way some jobs are offering lucrative one hundred thousand dollars in sign up bonuses these of course in the medical industry but here we have a story of a domino's pizza worker a missouri restaurant worker used the labor shortage to get a new job at domino's win a quick promotion and buy a second vehicle a report says he understood the shortage he negotiated a great deal and now he has a job but again what if these stories don't happen as the unemployment benefits expire the fed is all in all in, assuming that once the enhanced unemployment benefits expire, we will see workers filling those jobs and we will see inflation going down, therefore transitory. They're all in. But again, what if that doesn't happen? What if prices continue to rise higher? As your own beige book indicated, what if wages continue to rise higher, Mr. Powell? Do you have a plan for that? Because your tools are nuclear weapons. Raising interest rates, that's your tool, will destroy the entire global economy. We have a madman, a maniac, as the head of the Fed. Lastly, I want to comment on this story. Because Dallas Fed President Kaplan got caught. Caught trading stocks while he was printing and pumping stocks higher. Is this insider trading or what? The man knows that the Fed is putting their thumb on the scale and pushing stocks higher. And he's buying stocks with that knowledge at the same time. This is the definition of insider trading. But do you think the government will punish this criminal? The SEC will slam handcuffs on him? Of course not. Because for all you know, Chairman Gary Ginsler, the head of the SEC, is probably also trading stocks on the side. Perhaps even trading cryptos on the side. But rumor has it that Chairman Gary Ginsler is looking for a scapegoat here. He's not going to choose Dallas Fed President Kaplan. Maybe he will choose Meet Kevin, a certain YouTuber, somebody, because Ginsler is desperate for a scapegoat right now. And of course, Dallas Fed President Kaplan, aka the chairman, because he is a multi-millionaire, former Goldman Sachs executive leading the Fed, or hiring the bank robber to be bank security. And this guy has millions and millions of dollars. And oh, he loves chairs. Expensive chairs. He likes to sit on them. He likes to spread his leg, cross his leg, and sit like he's sitting on a throne. Oh, he loves that chair. He's married to the chair. And he sits on his... Uh, $20,000 chair while expressing his views and his understanding of the plight of the poor and the middle class. But perhaps now we know that Mr. Kaplan's hawkish stance regarding tapering and raising interest rates is perhaps a charade, a cover-up, a distraction from his crimes. And listen to kiss ass Steve Leisman of CNBC. And of course, it's not included in this interview, but if you caught it live, he kept saying, I know the gentleman. The gentleman from Texas, the gentleman from Dallas, I know the gentleman, and he's an honorable guy. He has the standards of ethics, the gentleman. I know him. I can vouch for him. Kiss ass, Steve Leisman. Morning, Joe. Yeah, Dallas Fed President Robert Kaplan held 27 separate stock alternative assets and fund holdings valued at more than a million dollars, and he conducted sales and or purchases in excess of a million dollars in 22 of those holdings during 2020. That is according to the review of his latest financial disclosures. Kaplan's holdings and transactions appear to be larger and his trading more frequent than his fellow Fed bank presidents. The Dallas Fed says none of his actions violated the bank's code of ethics. In a statement to CNBC, a spokesman said, 
All transactions were reviewed by the Dallas Fed's general counsel, who confirmed the transactions were in compliance with the bank's code of conduct. No trades were made during the Federal Reserve's blackout period during which trading activity is prohibited. The blackout period, when Fed officials typically cease making public statements on monetary policy and the economy, runs from the week before to two days after an FOMC meeting, typically. Kaplan amassed his fortune at Goldman Sachs, where he served as a vice chairman of, in, of investment banking and has divested hundreds of millions of dollars of Goldman shares. Among Kaplan's holdings, more than a million dollars in stocks in Apple, Alibaba, Facebook, and Goldman, and several, uh, sorry, and Google, pardon me, and several energy companies, including Marathon and Valero. Some of these he uh, were legacy before he joined the FOMC. It's unclear how much of each stock he has as a disclosure form only says the positions are larger than a million dollars. While larger in their own right, such holdings and trades are potentially small relative to his entire portfolio. Disclosures show several FOMC members with assets valued in the mil millions, including Fed Chair Jay Powell and Vice Chair Richard Clarida, many of which were accrued during careers in finance. But most members' assets were in mutual funds with some private equity and alternative investments. Joe? And the chairman is not alone, by the way. We have Boston Fed President Rosengren. Remember that one? He also got caught owning assets and trading assets while doing his job, printing at the Fed, buying a minimum of $40 billion worth of mortgage-backed securities per month while being invested in REITs. Separate filings for Dallas Fed Chief Bob Kaplan, a former Goldman Sachs executive, showed multiple $1 million plus transactions last year as the U.S. economy was convulsed by COVID-19. He also disclosed a $1 million plus stake in the Kansas City Royals baseball team. Wow. The U.S. Central Bank slashed interest rates to zero in March as the pandemic spread began, buying hundreds of billions of dollars worth of treasuries and mortgage-backed securities to calm financial markets. Rosengren, who has discussed his concerns in commercial real estate and public speeches, has also advocated for the Fed to consider scaling back its MBS purchases faster than treasuries to avoid overheating the housing market. The Wall Street Journal first reported Kaplan's trading activity, which included transaction of over $1 million in more than a dozen companies, including Delta Airlines, Alphabet, and Verizon Communications. All transactions were reviewed by the Dallas Fed's general counsel, who confirmed the transactions were in compliance with the Fed's code of conduct or with the bank's code of conduct. No trades were made during the Federal Reserve's blackout period, during which trading activity is prohibited, the Dallas Fed said in a statement. This is all garbage, of course. They play by different rules. If you and I get caught doing this, we'll be in jail forever. But these white-collar criminals continue to commit crimes, abusing their positions in the government and the system to enrich their own pockets. And the only punishment they receive is a slap on the wrist, pay some mediocre fine, and you're on your way to go back and commit the same crimes you've been committing. And this is not new, by the way. Your beloved politicians, they're also trading stocks and gambling left and right via call options with inside information and lining up their pockets. Nancy Pelosi been gambling via call options, hoping for stock prices for tech companies to go higher. Matter of fact, bidding that prices will go higher while she claims to be regulating the same companies. She knows that the Biden administration will initiate policies favorable to solar, electric vehicles, and wind farm mills. And what does she do? She uses this inside information to buy call options on electric vehicles stocks, the likes of Tesla and solar stocks, hoping that prices will go higher in reaction to the administration's policies. Isn't this insider trading? Three members of Congress failed to properly disclose up to $22 million of stock trades, Watchdog says. The late disclosures by Senator Tuberville, Representative Blake Moore, and Representative Pat Fallon all violated the Stock Act, the Campaign Legal Center said in its complaints to the Senate Ethics Committee and the Office of Congressional Ethics. Tuberville and Moore reported their trades in July, six months after their first trades, while Fallon disclosed his trading in June, four months after his earliest transaction. Fallon's trade worth between $7.8 million and $17.53 million included shares of Boeing, which he oversees as a member of 
the House Armed Services Committee. Tuberville's trades worth between $894,000 and $3.56 million included shares of health care companies that he oversees as a member of the Senate Health Committee. Surprise, surprise. Moore's trades were between $70,000 and 1.1 million. Again, a bunch of millionaires that we elect to quote-unquote lead us, but all they do is use the job to collect insider information and trade and get richer based on that information. Even Rand Paul got caught with his pants down, his wife trading stocks based on insider information. And then we have Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Remember that one? She also got caught doing insider trading. But what's new, right? Business per usual. And we have another criminal here, Representative Malamsky, who also got caught doing insider trading. And this is the swamp, ladies and gentlemen. This is crime per usual. White collar crimes from politicians, public officials, business leaders, crimes that go on every single day unpunished but god forbid god forbid you get caught with a little bag of weed in your pocket you're gonna go to jail for a long time and even when you're out it's gonna be on your records ruining your life and this is the current state of justice in america let's move on to the market's performance today and here we go the Dow Industrial Average closing in the red down by 68.93 points or a decline of 0.20%. The Nasdaq closing in the red down 87.69 points or a decline of 0.57%. The S&P 500 also closing in the red down 5.96 points or a decline of 0.13%. What about the sector's performance today? Leading the pack at number one, utilities. Of course, capturing the gold medal. At number two for the silver, consumer defensives. At number three for the bronze, REITs. Once again, a defensive, a highly defensive day. What's not working, by the way? The offensive sectors of the market, energy, materials, and technology. What about the advanced to decline ratios? NYSE, 34% advancing versus 65% declining. The NASDAQ, 27% advancing versus 69% declining. Not good breadth here. The Nasdaq, only 27% of stocks in the Nasdaq advancing today, but somehow not a major decline because the big cap technology stocks remain intact for now. Keyword for now. What about futures? What's going on here? We talked about crude oil prices rising higher, but sto the story was in natural gas, a massive surge, over 7.5% gains today. And we're closing at five bucks here. This is, of course, due to the aftermath of Hurricane Ida, which caused massive impact, massive damages to the energy infrastructure, pipes, transportation, and even agricultural land. And now we're realizing the severity of the storm. This will cause shortages, not just in energy, by the way, but also in grains because it hit the heart of the agriculture economy in the country. We witnessed some losses here in softs specifically for lumber, OJ, and coffee futures, all trading down. Meanwhile, a flattish day for cocoa, cotton, and sugar futures. What about metals? Gold remains stable on the flat line, but we're seeing losses here for silver, platinum, copper, and palladium futures. Not a surprise when the US dollar was having a great day. What about meats? Modest declines here, led by lean hogs, live cattle, and then feeder cattle futures. And of course, in the intro, we talked about the shortage in meats and the efforts from the Biden administration to curb the inflation in meats prices, specifically beef prices. So it would be interesting to see how live cattle futures react in the next few days because the shortage is legitimate. The supply from South America is pretty much halted right now due to the cases of the mad cow disease. But will the psychology from Biden threatening to curb inflation and meat prices work out at least at least in the short term? We'll see. What about grains? Flattish day, no major movements at all beside losses for wheat and oats futures. Moving on to the big casino, the options market. What's going on here? Leading the pack at number one, not Apple. Here it is, Tesla, the souffle. 
with about 1.3 million contracts, about 59% of those were calls. And at number two, Apple, with about 1 million contracts, about 72% of those were calls. And at number three, AMC, with about 400,000 contracts, about 77% of those were calls. Names like GSAT, BBIG, CLOV, SPRT, all of these meme stocks remain extremely active in the options market. Significant volume, unusual volume in all of these meme stocks. And we have more popping up by the day. For example, you have the ticker ROOT, root rising higher, and we're seeing massive bids to push the stock higher. Moving on to unusual activities, what's going on here? We have a massive trade betting against the NASDAQ, betting that the NASDAQ will crash. The ticker is triple Q's, the NASDAQ, and the trade is they bought the 331 puts with the expiration date of November 19th, with the expectations that the NASDAQ will crash by over 13% by then. And they paid about 3 bucks and 11 cents, all in all, spending about $23 million. What about the trade for the ticker BBIG? They continue to bid this name higher with insane amounts, unbelievable amounts. And my guess is, perhaps we have certain hedge funds who got caught with their pants down, shorting the stock, and now they have to cover. But what they're, do what they're doing at the same time is also buying call options way out of the money. So as they cover, they're profiting from the call options because these are insane amounts. I cannot believe that this is a retail story. For example, here's a trade, a bullish one. They bought the 12 bucks calls with the expiration date of this upcoming Friday, September 10th. With the expectations that the name will rise higher by more than 11% by then, they paid about 70 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about $1.75 million. Again, we have seen millions and millions of dollars for single trades, by the way, in this name. So my hunch is these are hedge funds covering and buying calls at the same time. We also saw unusual activities, massive buying of puts for Twitter, the ticker TWTR. Here's was one of them. They bought the 58 puts expiration date, September 24th, with the expectations that the name will drop by over 7% by then. They paid about 50 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about $1 million. What about the trade for the ticker ARKK for Tesla Witch Kathy Wood? We're seeing more and more bearish trades on this name too, following the footsteps of Michael Burry. This time around, they're buying the 113 puts with the expiration date of September 24th, with expectations that the name will drop by more than 7% by then. They paid about one buck and 50 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about $1.5 seven million dollars and this is perhaps it's a small trade but it's an indicator that there is certainty in the market that we're about to have a correction in september perhaps the correction already started by the way because unusual trades for tickers like spxu which is an inverse etf on the spy usually don't happen unless we have certainty in the market that the correction will happen. This ETF rises as the SPY drops. SPXU, they bought the 16 and a half calls with the expiration date of September 17th, with the expectations that the name will rise higher by over 7% by then. They paid about 13 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending about $150,000. What about the trade for the ticker PA? TH path and this is for UI path whatever that is the name was down significantly so by the tune of about 10% somebody here is betting for a rebound that is about to happen by buying the 60 bucks calls expiration date September 17th with expectations that the name will rise higher by more than 6% by then and they paid about 80 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about $750,000 what about the ticker AMC C4, you guessed it, AMC. They're betting for a pullback here, and I agree, by the way, I will show you in the technical analysis that AMC is about to drop. They bought the 45 puts with the expiration date of September 10th, meaning this upcoming Friday, we have two days for expiration here, with the expectations that AMC will drop by more than 7% by then. They paid about one buck a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about nine hundred thousand dollars what about the trade for the ticker xlk this is the technology etf 
Another unusual trade, by the way, and we see these kind of trades for the SPXU and the XLK in the options market when we have certainty that the NASDAQ and technology names are about to sell off. In this case, they bought the 147 puts expiration date October 1st, with the expectations that the name will drop by more than 7% by then, and they paid about 60 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about four hundred and fifty thousand dollars continuing with unusual trades what about the ticker amd for amd we have a bullish trade here buying the 115 call with the expiration date of october 8th the expectations are for amd to rise by more than eight percent by then and they paid about a buck and 80 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about three hundred and twenty five thousand dollars what about the trade for the ticker her TBPH. This is for Theravance, Biopharma, whatever. This is an unusual trade, by the way. Perhaps an insider. I'm pretty sure it's an insider here because they're buying calls on an unusual name, a Biopharma name, and they're keeping the trade below 1 million, meaning below the radar. Nobody's going to suspect that this is an insider trade, but we caught it. And in this case, they bought the 10 bucks calls expiration date October 15th with the expectations that the name will pop higher for wink wink news, upcoming news by more than 15% or more. They paid about one buck and 25 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending about $600,000. What about the trade for the ticker LEN Lenar, home builder? And perhaps a proxy bet against yields, betting that yields will go down. Because when yields go down, we witness stocks like Lennar and other home builders rising higher. In this case, they bought the 110 calls with the expiration date of November 19th, with the expectations that the name will pop higher by more than 9% or so, and they paid about 2 bucks and 50 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending about $1.2 million. Lastly, what about the trade for the ticker ATER? This is for Aterian, whatever that is. They bought the 10 bucks calls, perhaps another meme stock, by the way. They bought the 10 bucks calls with the expiration date of October 15th, with the expectations that the name will pop higher by more than 7.5% by then. They paid about 2 bucks and 30 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about $1 million. We're moving on to charts, starting with the SPY 30 minutes chart. Now, we have a semi bear flag formation, but perhaps not as strong as the previous bear flag, which played out today, and those who bought put options scored significant gains. Now, you have to combine this knowledge, the chart pattern. We have a bear flag, but we also have to combine that with the momentum indicators. And the RSI was reading at oversold conditions from an intraday perspective, meaning we've been anticipating a bounce and we got a bounce today. The market closed off the lows. So I call this a weak bear flag, not a significant one. And the SPY might actually rebound tomorrow. But the weakness overall regarding the sentiment is starting to become more evident. If the market flushes down, in the case of the SPY, we're looking for 447 for support. If the market decides to pop higher and build on the rebound that we got today, then I'm looking at 452 as possible resistance. Perhaps a soft one, but the market will face some resistance at that point. Moving on to the continuous contract, the daily chart for the continuous contract and the SPY. What's going on here? The momentum indicators, the RSI and MACD are weakening, perhaps topping as we see curling to the downside. Likewise, we're seeing volume picking up higher, therefore confirming the weakness and perhaps that we have a top right here. If we have a top and the SPY decides to go down, how far would the correction be from the top? Here it is, about 2.77, let's say 3% from the top. Again, is this crazy? Not at all. This is a garden variety pullback. This is a trend line, and the chart has been respecting the trend line. So the expectations are, if the trend is still intact, that we have a correction, a pullback all the way to the trend line, and perhaps then bouncing higher once again. But I'm not liking the spike in volume. The spike in volume is an ominous signal here. What about the Qs? What's going on here? Doing a little better than the SPY. And now we have a resistance to look forward to, which is around 382 and a half. Look at the RSI indicator from a 30 minutes perspective. This is intraday. In the morning, 
we went back to oversold conditions in the RSI, meriting a bounce. And we got the bounce. But now we have a bear flag. Will it play out? We'll see because the last one did not work out. And unlike the SPY, we did not see a spike in volume in the NASDAQ. Matter of fact, this is a daily chart for the continuous contract in the NASDAQ. The volume was slightly higher than usual. But the volume came in buying the dip. And therefore, the NASDAQ has better legs to stand on, at least from the action we got today. From a candlestick pattern, it remains a bullish pattern, a bull flag pattern. But when you look at the MACD indicators, excuse me, the momentum indicators, the MACD and the RSI, we have a slight curling here to the downside, perhaps weakening, perhaps topping. And if we get a confirmation, breaking the bull flag formation, spiking the volume higher, trading on a down day, this will be a confirmation of a reversal in the Nasdaq. For now, we don't have that signal. What about the IWM flushing down all the way to the support of 223? Again, it's a bear flag formation, but we have gotten to oversold conditions from an intraday perspective. Charts usually bounce from oversold conditions. Was the bounce today in the IWM it, or do we have more to build on the bounce? And again, how could the sentiment be bullish when the IWM is leading the decliners today? Meanwhile, utilities are performing along with REITs and defensives. And this is an ominous signal, by the way. Perhaps a leading indicator that we're about to see a severe correction in the market. The IWM is underperforming. And we know if the NASDAQ starts to correct going back to the trend line, the correction will be 10%, which is a severe correction. But we have not had a correction in the market for a long time. So all of that energy will be released to the downside if we have a correction. I'm not liking the way the IWM, the Russell 2000, is trading so far. Dixie, what's going on here? Popping higher, specifically overnight, which tells me that overseas buyers are more interested in popping the dollar higher than U.S. investors because the dollar was trading higher in the morning and then it stopped trading higher. It pulled back and stayed calm to the end of the day and this enabled the market to rebound off the lows. The resistance remains 93, and my bet is we're going to see the dollar spiking up higher because the catalysts, the tailwinds, are, are building up. What about gold? What's going on here? Not a good day for gold. The sell-off continues, and perhaps we'll go down all the way to the support in or around 1,760, which happens to be the Fibonacci retracement level. This is, of course, assuming that the dollar will pop higher. But here is the second enemy for gold, yields. What's going on here? Specifically, the 10-year yield. A down day for yields, specifically at the long end, the 10 and 30. We had an auction today, and once again, it was an excellent auction. Overseas buyers, specifically from Asia, continue to buy U.S. bonds, seeking quote-unquote safety. The problem is, the biggest sugar daddy is the Fed. And if the Fed is about to taper, it doesn't matter. The end effect is, you're going to have the sugar daddy slowing down the purchases of bonds. And therefore, bond prices will go down, yields will spike up higher. This is the chart for the TLT, weekly chart. The candle is looking a little better today, rebound day for the TLT as yields went down. Yet the final judgment will be on Friday, the weekly closing. Will the TLT close above or below 149? We have important data for inflation on Friday. The VIX, what's going on here? Perhaps the most reliable indicator for now. You take a look at the four hours chart, every pop. Every single pop in the MACD indicator, creating green impressions in the histogram, every single pop produced double digits gains in the VIX and predicted a pullback in the SPY correctly. Now, what about the prop that we have right now? Is it over? Does it still have more juice to go? We'll see tomorrow, but we have a slight curling here, slight weakness. And we've seen the weakness before, before the VIX builds on more energy and continues to pop higher. Apple, what's going on here? 30 minutes chart. Remember the pop from yesterday? Another pop, another phony market manipulation pop. And now Apple flushes down right away. Pump and dump back to the trend line. So far, the trend line has not been broken. Oh, and by the way, 150 remains intact. I'm not going to panic here until Apple breaks 150. Then I'm going to start shitting my pants. But for now, the market remains intact. So long as Apple remains intact. Tesla, what's going on here? Popping higher again, yet closing well below the highs of the day and well above the lows of the day. What does that mean? It means that Tesla closed flat and therefore no update at all. The pattern remains intact, higher highs and higher lows. 
until and unless this pattern is negated, we don't have a problem at all with the souffle. Tulips, what's going on here with cryptos? Specifically BTC, still in shock, still holding breath, processing what happened yesterday. But I'm not going to feel comfortable here until and unless BTC goes down to 42,000. Retest the support and then bouncing higher. And we have a confirmation of the bounce. But for now, this is not looking good at all. AMC, what's going on here? 42 and a half is a solid support, but perhaps we have resistance around 49. The chart tried over and over and over again with no success at all. Would it be a sin for the chart to go down, close the gap, perhaps retest 42 and a half once again? Not at all. And we have bad news after hours from GME GameStop trading down so the expectations are that amc will also trade down not a guarantee but they usually trade together now we have also bad news fundamental news perhaps psychological news for amc the headline reads retail investors sold 2.45 million dollars of amc entertainment shares on tuesday marking the first time the group became sellers of the stock since february these are the apes by the way stabbing each other in the back like the planet of the apes again 2.45 million is a small amount but you get what you gotta watch out for is the snowballing effect the domino effect it starts with 2.45 million and it evolves to 50 million 80 million 500 million and now we're talking right i'm also underlying the word fatigue this is the worst enemy for the apes fatigue it's a battle of psychology they've been huddling for a long time waiting for the holy short squeeze which is not happening by the way and even if it happens it's a negligible event we're talking about 15 to 18 percent of the float shorted that's nothing Think about it. You have other trees with bananas around you. The AMC trees is out of bananas. But we have BBIG, SPRT, FUCK, a lot of meme stocks. Let's talk about them, by the way, starting with SPRT. This is one hour chart. In the beginning of the week, we were eyeing filling the gap above. But what did the chart do? Filling the gap below and then working its way higher. This is even better because it's healthier for the stock to move higher, overwork the oversold conditions, and go all the way to the gap. And as you can see in the MACD indicator, we have a confirmation of the positive momentum from a one-hour chart. Now, I bought call options on SPRT today, and after hours, the stock is popping 30% or so. It's insane. So this is working right away. But I bought put options on this name, BBIG. We talked about it over the weekend, or Monday rather, and I called it the weakest link in meme stocks right now. But the stock said, hey, we don't care what you call us. I'm going to keep popping higher. But there is another problem now. In the weekly chart, we have a solid resistance around 1150, specifically 1165. So once the stock got there, I took the shot buying put options and we'll see what happens tomorrow. If I get whacked, I get whacked because usually meme stocks trade together. They pop together and they go down together. But this is not how meme stocks have been behaving lately. We're seeing rotations from meme to meme. This is my bet at least. And again, if I get a pie in the face, it is what it is. Next, we have KPLT. This is a five minutes chart, an update from the chart I showed you on Monday. We were expecting the name to pop higher. And indeed, it popped higher by the tune of about 16%. But now the chart is pulling back. So here's an update. We are using the 30 minutes chart, by the way. We have a bear flag and the chart is about to violate the important level of $6. And if that happens, then we will see a flush down in KPLT. My bet is the stock will trade down. Perhaps the best of the gains are behind us now. Lastly, by popular demand, what about GME, GameStop? You ask? I deliver. We have a wedge formation, a massive one. The chart is battling the resistance. And after hours, after earnings, the stock is trading down. If that continues, and the expectations are the stock will go down to the ascending edge of the wedge, which happens to be the lower edge, meaning more losses to the tune of about 16.5%. Moving on to the conclusion of this video, what do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have, per usual, the weekly jobless claims, which are becoming more important by the day because the Fed is putting more emphasis on employment numbers. You have Williams, the dirtbag that he is, coming out today and saying, oh, by the way, we have not met substantial further progress in employment 
Therefore, we're not tapering, even though data shows that we have more jobs openings than people looking for jobs. But perhaps when the weekly unemployment claims drop below 300,000, will that be enough for Williams and other Fed zombies to start tapering? We'll see. Anyhow, folks, this is all I got for you for now, but I will talk to you again tomorrow. If you found the information presented in this video helpful, please subscribe, press the like button, the notification button and follow me on social media.